morning, everybody. We're so happy to be here. Uh, and I'm really excited to speak with my uh, fellow panelists today, Karen Fournier and uh, Zainab Oshan. And we're just going to be talking about uh, a little bit about our backgrounds and our experiences, um, I think both in work and our, our research areas, as well as in teaching, uh, sharing some ideas and just having a, a conversation in honor of Women's History Month. And uh, I'll just start with a quick introduction. Uh, I'm Ellen Rowe. I'm in the Jazz and Contemporary Improvisation Department. Uh, I'm also chair of the Conducting Department. I'm a jazz pianist and a composer. Uh, I've been here at the University of Michigan for, yikes, maybe 20 some years, 22, something like that. Uh, I taught at University of Connecticut before that. Um, I've had, a, I think, a, a very interesting life trying to, as my colleagues here have, trying to balance um, research and teaching, trying to balance jazz composition, jazz performance, uh, and, and my work at the various institutions I've taught at. Uh, jazz is, of course, uh, still, unfortunately, a, a, no, I hate using that word. Uh, jazz is still a primarily male-dominated field. Uh, there are more and more incredible women jazz artists uh, coming to the fore and more, you know, there've been some wonderful all women bands that have been on the forefront uh, and jazz festivals and on, on gigs and concert halls uh, recently, which is, is exciting. Uh, and I'm one of the particular areas that I'm interested in right now is mentoring and advocacy for young women jazz players and composers, uh, trying to help them through the difficult <laughs> times in junior high and high school, um, getting them to the college programs so that they can really spread their wings and pursue professional careers. Uh, I've certainly had my share of uh, interesting problems with being a woman in a male dominated field over the last, uh, gosh, four years of my career, which, uh, you know, we can, I think we'll be sharing some experiences later, which I won't get into now, but uh, a very quick capsule biography. Uh, just I went to the Eastman School of Music as a music education major, uh, stayed there to do a master's in jazz composition and, and performance. Um, stayed around Rochester, New York for a little while to play solo piano and, and, and do some jazz composition work. Moved to New York for a little bit, uh, then went from there to a cruise ship job, which was a lot of fun and very interesting. I got a lot of uh, great experience on board. Uh, and then was able to get a part-time teaching position at the University of Connecticut right off the cruise ship. And that was the start of my academic teaching career. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be put in a position where I actually got to start the jazz program at the University of Connecticut. Uh, so that had a lot of uh, interesting aspects to it, being a young woman at the time. I think I was 24 when I started my college teaching career uh, and had 12 years there and then came out to Ann Arbor, Michigan to um, teach at the University of Michigan. And since I've been working um, to get jazz compositions published, um, I've got maybe 12 or 15 pieces spread around a couple different uh, publishing companies. Uh, I've gotten five CDs out as a, as a leader of my own various bands. Um, and I'm now actually in a, to, to talk with Karen, both of these people a little bit after this about um, getting um, writing published because I'm writing a chapter for Routledge now on jazz and gender uh, and I'm struggling a little bit, but uh, it's an exciting opportunity. So um, enough about me. Uh, I think I will now introduce Karen Fournier from the theory department and uh, take it away, Karen. Thank you. So my career uh, as a music theorist never opened up the, the cruise ship possibility to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I really missed out on something. Uh, I'm a music theorist and I've been at uh, Michigan since 2005. So that makes 16 years. Uh, I'm an associate professor uh, in the, in the uh, music theory department. Uh, prior to being here, I actually worked for three years at, at one of the satellite uh, University of Wisconsin schools, and I did something similar to you, Ellen, where I was hired straight out of my PhD, so I didn't have that cruise ship uh, break, uh, and, uh, but I was hired into a program that was trying to revamp its theory um, offerings. Uh, it was um, a program that was sort of stuck in a, pa in a past and was looking to, uh, looking to sort of make theory a little more contemporary. Uh, and a little more responsive uh, to students, particularly students in music ed. That program had a very strong music ed, uh, ed uh, cohort. And I was there for about three years and then came here uh, so with no gaps in, in my career. And I actually, I was one of the very fortunate ones. I graduated um, in 2001. I actually defended my dissertation on September 18th a week after 9-11. And um, at that time, you know, the, the economy was sort of 
uh, wonky for academics. And I feel very fortunate that in fact, I was able to, to get a, a job right out of my PhD. So I've been here for about 16 years, during which time uh, I've seen the field change around me and I've also changed, uh, you know, accordingly. Uh, so my PhD dissertation was actually about epistemology and I was very interested in, uh, you know, the, the sociology of knowledge. Uh, I didn't sort of do a, a mainstream theory uh, dissertation, uh, you know, something typical of the time, which would have led me into, you know, uh, close readings of musical works using Schenker or set theory. I was more interested in, you know, how we formulate questions about uh, about musical works and how we determine how we're going to to uh, to to analyze musical works uh, and gatekeeping and all of those kinds of things. And maybe that led naturally, I don't know, to my current study on punk. I was always sort of an outsider in my field and uh, and you know I grew up as well uh, lived in England with my parents in the uh, in the 80s and so became very interested in punk at that time so I've moved into punk rock and and in particular uh, one of the things that always sort of compelled me uh, about punk was its involvement of women uh, in ways that uh, that popular music had not seen prior to you know prior to the late seventies uh, when punk kind of you know uh, emerged on the scene uh, you know and and so as somebody somebody in the in the early eighties looking out at popular culture and looking for representations of myself I always found it so interesting to, to see you know women on drums in punk bands which you didn't see in mainstream uh, music you know women on bass guitar uh, and also women sort of behaving as rock stars behave you know not demure. Uh, not groupies, but actually being sort of front and center and and sort of assuming all of those kinds of rock behaviors and rock poses for better or for worse, you know. Uh, um, and so that's that's where I where I stand right now. I've been publishing in the area of gender and punk. Uh, I've also uh, been very interested in the riot in the riot girl and angry young woman phenomenon. So I have a book on on Alanis Morissette uh, and uh, and I'm currently now working on um, trans uh, identity in punk uh, in the New York punk scene, uh, looking at uh, at two uh, punk artists in particular and their experiences uh, in the in the nascent punk scene in the 1970s. And so that's where I am. And so I'm really looking forward to this discussion too. Oh, thank you so much, Karen. Um, Zainab, can, would you like to introduce yourself and talk about your, your work and what you're doing at Michigan? Hi, uh, my name is Zainab Ozjan. I am a professor lecturer at the Department of Performing Arts Technology at the University of Michigan. I teach creative coding music here at the SMTD for about one and a half years. And I'm also a faculty director of Girls in Music Technology Summer Camp. We go virtual again this summer. Hmm. And I also contribute to secondary education and community education, where I teach electronic music composition, audio programming, soundscape, or sound, uh, sound studies related courses. And I'm really interested into creating you know, equal access to learning and offer affordable college level education as much as possible outside the academia. Uh, well, I studied philosophy and then I studied architectural history. As my master's, I studied Zenakis's work and his compositions and architectural work as a dissertation. And then I <laughs> do my PhD in music department. Um, I study sound and sonic arts. So yeah, as a very multidisciplinary department, yeah, and as a multidisciplinary person, it's become my passion to introduce this field, you know, uh, to the young girls as much as possible. And I try to expose them as much as new information because um, I, I'm really interested into building a community, including diverse groups and backgrounds so that they can, because I mean, you know, it's like a very taboo thing when, it, when, it's, uh, when we talk about music and technology, I always feel like, and everyone in my field feels like music, uh, you know, musicians or the composers should supposed to be women and the you know, recording engineers and the electronical and technical stuff has to be men, but it's not like that. Actually, you know, Ellen, you also talk about how it is in jazz or how it is in theory, or it's like in every field we have very, uh, we have gender imbalance. So, and also, uh, unfortunately, some of the students have self doubt and self confidence, and mm -hmm. they also cope with these feelings all the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in my courses, I try to. You know, encourage them as much as possible about learning new things like they are you know uh, male colleagues as well 
I, that brings up a question that, that uh, I don't think I've ever asked any of the PAT faculty. How many young women are there in the PAT department in terms of, you know, for students? I mean, for my course right now, I have six students. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, which is nice. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I was wondering how many majors we, we had. I, I know that uh, they're the same issues that I, th I think both jazz and Pat share in terms of trying to recruit young women. So I was, I was interested to hear that. Um, how, I, I know that there is a interest here in possibly sharing some stories that we might have or experiences we might have had as women in our in our fields. And I wondered if, you know, either of you would like to share any any thoughts on that? Or Karen, do you have a... <laughs> do I really want to go there? Uh, you know, I was sort of interested. Uh, I, I'm going to sidestep your question and I may I may see how this goes. Um, I was actually really interested in in just this notion of woman and how you know we we talk about international women's uh, uh, month and I think it's you know it's it's uh, it's a really important discussion to have um, but I was sort of thinking I was looking at statistics actually in my field uh, and I was asking myself have things improved so the Society for Music Theory actually keeps uh, keeps records of of gender uh, in. Uh, in the field. And um, so, you know, totally sidestepping your question. Um, but, uh, but I think it does, it does sort of, you know, it does sort of add to to one's experience to think about a representation in the field. Uh, our field uh, is typically uh, it sort of hovers around uh, 33, 31 to 33% female at any given year. And I've looked back over the st statistics for the last, you know, a decade or so. Um, and the thing that really struck me about those statistics, and this is something that I'm, I'm thinking a lot about, is that um, is that if you t if you if you uh, impose those statistics on other statistics uh, in uh, in in that demographic study, we actually the, the 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 thing that concerns me the most is that that my field actually is represented by African Americans by, uh, by only one percent, and we're sort of hovering around around that. And you know, I I keep thinking if if our field is one percent African American and thirty percent women, uh, one percent of that thirty percent. Where are the African American women? Uh, one thing that has really struck me is uh, is underrepresentation by women of uh, of color, uh, and um, it's something that I think a lot about in terms both in terms of recruitment, supporting, mentoring. Um, you know, so I've had some challenges in the field for sure, but at least I'm in the field. Uh, and once you're in the field, you can sort of push back uh, against some of the, you know, some of the some of the challenges and some of the impediments that you face. Uh, but getting but getting other kinds of women into the field, I think, is a really important thing, uh, and then mentoring them and sharing experiences with them as well. So that is, you know, sort of a roundabout answer to your question, but it's something that I've been actually thinking an awful lot about, uh, sort of looking out at the field and thinking about identity and, and representation in the field. Uh, you know, women have a long way to go, but the category of woman isn't just a monolith. Uh, and, you know, I think that I think that we need to recognize that, you know, some women are uh, some women within that 30 percent uh, or 33 percent are woefully underrepresented and, and, and in some cases entirely absent. That's a really great and important point. And uh, I think looking at my field, uh, if I was going to take a guess at women just in academia in, in the jazz area um let's say we didn't count jazz vocalists where that's where the bulk of um jazz faculty are, are going to be female jazz faculty are going to be i would actually make a guess at five percent um which is a definite <laughs> definite problem and within that five percent maybe you know 0.05 of uh, women of color so mm -hmm. we absolutely are are dealing with the same issues um and I, you know, this gives us a chance to talk a little bit too, I think about mentorship and advocacy. And one of the, I, I run a program for the Jazz Education Network called Sisters in Jazz Collegiate Combo Competition. And we did this um, back when the, that group was actually called the International Association for Jazz Education. Uh, we ran, we started the program at that point and, you know, set up mentoring networks in various cities around the country and started running this competition uh, that was only for young women and we've seen similar issues uh, back then and also now 
in terms of representation and diversity. And, you know, it points out the fact that, that while we're, you know, still struggling to get more young women, you know, playing jazz and, and pursuing it in college, especially, um, we're having even more of a, a trouble um, finding the resources to support young women of color. And um, I, I think that's definitely something that has to be addressed. Uh, one of the things that's been interesting for me is uh, I also, when I had the good fortune when Jerry Allen was my colleague here at Michigan, um, she and I talked a lot about this and we started a, a camp and she started a camp in Newark, New Jersey, uh, just for young women jazz players uh, from ages 12 on up to 25, which was really nice to have that age range because you can really work with younger students and you can also, you know, have college students in there who can mentor the younger woman. Uh, and, and that was wonderful because we were based in Newark and we had a very, very diverse and still do. The camp is running now. Regina Carter has taken it over, which is wonderful. We now call it the Jerry Allen Jazz Camp. Um, and so when I, when I see programs like that, um, I really start feeling hopeful because I see the support that that is giving young women, uh, both young white women and young women of color. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that I think really needs to, to happen around the country. But um, Zena, I know you're you know, active in mentorship and advocacy. Um, what kinds of things do you see happening in your area? I mean, before, I guess, when I was a college student or when I was doing my PhD, I wasn't feeling alone because I think I wasn't exactly thinking about this problem until I got my PhD, started to teach and moved to another country and saw the same issues. Because you, I was, I mean, I have actually a note that I keep, I, I mean, it may sound a little bit interesting, but I heard a, little, a lot of comments about me, about my field. So I sometimes take notes about them so that I don't forget <laughs> and say it here now. I mean, things a little bit got ex exhalated when I started to incorporate technology in my field. And I mean, I've been told we women are composing in a specific way because the way we have been raised, the way we've been told to play when we were kids, the way we've been you know, told to be sit down. And also, I mean, I heard about uh, why do I use technology and programming in my field? It looks weird on women. Even I don't even understand. It looks complicated. It doesn't look good on you or things like that. And why do you, you know, mix that much stuff, meaning about my, you know, uh, multidisciplinary background. And I was okay. I wasn't even, okay, yeah. And I said, yeah, whatever. And keep doing what I do. Because I was thinking, yeah, it's going to change because of the age I'm living, I guess, or the, maybe the where I am right now, or maybe my surrounding is bad. But then I moved to another country and saw the same issues. <laughs> that was the defining moment for me. And wow. regardless of the age of my students, regardless of their economic background, I don't know, regardless of their um, parents' education level, the country they live in, the feeling is there. They just feel alone they don't feel like they belong to you know they feel alone when for example in if they're in a recording studio I still hear the things uh like oh I'm the only you know female in the room and that's why I feel like I have to do you know perfect recording everything has to be nice and good <laughs> otherwise another male gets the job for me mm -hmm. and that's why unfortunately lots of female students are not exploring enough for instance, I think my course is like, since it's called it, you know, creative coding for music, it's supposed to be about exploring and, you know, failing and trying new stuff, but it might be the, you know, reason because of this education is based on grades, but they're just trying to do the right stuff all the time. So this is, this was like shocking for me because I thought, oh yeah, my students probably don't even feel alone or don't even get this comment, sexist comments just because of their gender. Do you get the feeling uh, in a recording studio uh, that maybe part of what contributes to that is um, maybe a lack of, of, of mutual support or support for women? I mean, I keep thinking about, you know, we, we hear a lot about the boys network and, and uh, you know, the fact that, that, you know, men tend to support each other and there's kind of this camaraderie and, and mutual support that I, I have, rarely experienced among women uh, that there seems to be it seems to be more isolating for women than it is for men um, I don't know is is that is that has been has that been your experience in the recording studio 
I mean, for yeah, for instance, I never heard a sentence from a if you know male students. They don't say think. Okay, I don't know anything about this field, and mm -hmm. can I do it? You know, I mean, it's an introductory course. Yes, <laughs> you can do everything, but they are just hesitated so much. Even though it's a freshman level, or even though it's a beginner level course, uh, I just always receive emails about they don't know anything about this field. Should they do it? It's yeah, of course. I mean. Yeah, I think if you come from a position of power, then you have a, a self assurance that, uh, you know, that that doesn't that doesn't sort of invite those kinds of those kinds it invites you to sort of entertain those kinds of questions, or it doesn't invite self doubt. And I think that um, I think that, you know, sometimes females, uh, female students and female faculty too, um, uh, have to kind of power through some of the self doubt. In order to in order to get through uh, in order to get to where they need to be or want to be or should be actually deserve to be mm -hmm. uh, you know something something else that i you know once again i go back to my statistics this conversation sort of inspired me to look back into the statistics in my field and so again the demographic study uh in my field actually shows that um women's women start to fall off uh, when it comes to uh, to ascending in ranks from from assistant professor uh, all the way up to full professor. Um, so in my field, the, the latest data showed that 25, 24.1, I think it was, percent of women of, of full professors were female. Um, what happens? And, you know, uh, uh, down at the bottom of that pyramid, we have assistant professors that are making, you know, mid 30 percent. Uh, and so what what is happening to women that sort of stifles their uh, their their progress uh, through through their careers. Um, you know, I think we face we face sort of unique um, uh, challenges. Motherhood, for example, uh, is is something that uh, that that can potentially hamper um, uh, your career. Um, but I also wonder if there are sort of social expectations or you know uh, self doubt or those kinds of things uh, that can potentially be. Um, be be negative in one's career as well. Ellen, I see you nodding. So do, are you, I mean, is the, I don't, do you have similar, similar sorts of thoughts? Oh, absolutely. I think about this all the time. Um, I still find myself uh, not racked with self-doubt. I think I've moved past that phase, but questioning. And, and uh, I think in general, women are, you know, we're fairly introspective often and, and willing to you know question ourselves and and maybe more so sometimes than our than our male colleagues but that given all the other societal pressures and the fact that we may be somewhat alone in our our field or our department um it it definitely creates uh it, it, it heightens the insecurity let's let's put it that way that we may have um and i i think it's uh I've looked at those figures too that that show the falling off from you know assistant professor on up, and I think there's so many factors at, at work there, um, from the self doubt to the lack of support, um, to you know any even little things like sitting in meetings and constantly being interrupted. To, you know, I mean, it just makes it's a it's a whole big picture. But um, one of the, one of the things I have noticed, and it's been very interesting for me that there's sort of been this pendulum. Um, when we first started these all women groups, um, especially for young women, it was, you know, it was just, this is great. This is wonderful. And there is a certain amount of that happening in the professional world as well. And then this pendulum started to swing a bit. So a lot of these women professional artists were saying, wait a minute, no, we just want to be on the same playing field. We want to be in, you know, mixed groups with men. We don't want to be identified as only playing in all women groups. Mm -hmm. And, and I completely got that. And, you know, we do need to be completely integrated um, into, into groups. But now what I'm starting to see, and especially as I, for the first time, my last CD is an all women project and the same kind of com camaraderie that we've seen in our groups, all women groups for the young women, um, for the jazz education network, whatever, uh, extends into the professional world and in the recording studio. It's such an incredible feeling to be there with seven other amazing women players and the joy and the love that they show each other and the support that we, we get from each other. And so I see the pendulum now swinging back and some of these same you know, professional artists who are saying you know, no to all women groups are now starting to say yes because it is such an incredibly supportive and wonderful environment to be in and it's bolstering our confidence and i think with the young women it bolsters their confidence to be supported in that fashion so that when they are going out into the integrated groups 
uh, they're able to hold their own and, and, you know, feel better about playing and expressing themselves. Um, so yeah, I have been thinking along those lines for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll agree with you about the all women's groups because my current course is open to women identified non-binary and trans people only. And at the beginning I was thinking, is, am I doing, <laughs> I mean, should it be like this? I mean, but after three courses, or the, you know, the comments I hear about the course or the comments I hear heard at the beginning of the course because they talk about how they want a secure space to compose mm -hmm. without any criticism. Or mm -hmm. when I ask them, why do you take this course? I mean, why are you here? One of my students told me, uh, well, I was a mother and I finally had the time to. <laughs> so, and I did not want to be, you know, another environment where I just, you know, where we have other male composers where they just talk about their work on and on and on because I was a mother and I wasn't able to compose about like 10 years maybe. Mm. And I thought, okay, I think it's necessary to create courses like that so that they can feel, okay, they can forget about being criticized or they can forget about being perfect all the time and they can just, you know, start trying things, start learning things in that, you know, feel. It and then they, sorry. I, it, it makes me so sad to hear you say this, this idea that you can, if you're a mother, you can't be serious about something else. Yeah. The implication, you know, mm -hmm. that, that somehow or another, you know, you as a mother uh, should be entirely focused on your child and, and that's it for your career. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I hadn't really, I mean, I've certainly thought about people who have to, you know, put their careers maybe on, on hold to raise children. I don't have children of my own, just a very needy cat, but then I know the similarity is not, is not a good one. Um, but uh, I'd never really thought about the concept of the word mother and just sort of the, not ramifications, but uh, sort of there's an undercurrent there, isn't there, that goes along with that. Well, Ellen, I don't know about you. I mean, I certainly think that um, it's it it was in the forefront of my mind at certain points in my life, uh, where where I thought to myself, you know, I, I, that I had to make a choice between a personal life and a professional life, which I think you know my male colleagues probably have not had to think about, uh, you know, uh, either my male colleagues in graduate school uh, or my male colleagues in the profession. Um, you know, so, you know, here I am in my fifties and, you know, I have not had children, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of bounced between relationships, but that's been, you know, that's, that has always been sort of a side story to the main story, which has been the career. And I don't think that, uh, you know, I, I don't think that that's unique to me. Uh, I know a lot of women who, who have kind of put their personal lives to the side in, in, you know, in, in the quest for advancement in their career. Um, so, you know, I think that 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 that's a, that's sort of the flip side of the motherhood thing <laughs> that, you know, that that some of us have opted against that because uh, because we recognize that 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 could potentially be a stumbling block. Hmm. You know, and I don't think that men have had to have those kinds of conversations with themselves. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely don't think so. <laughs> yeah. for, for example, this summer I saw a call it was about it was calling mother painters you know and they just had to go there with their kids it was a residency call but you had to be mother to apply or you had to be pregnant and i just sent them to my friend uh, thinking oh okay you should go there and i he, she told me oh, okay you don't ki have kids how am i supposed to go there with my two kids and leave my home and just paint there I, because i thought it was oh this is such a this is such a nice you know call maybe we should create something like that in music just you know, create a call for pregnant women, and apparently it wasn't realistic for everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really hard, to, you know, uh, feel to create for them, I guess. You know, there's been a there's been uh, some research in popular music about motherhood, uh, and you know, motherhood and popular and, and popular music uh, artists, and uh, you know, this notion of the the bad mother too. Uh, you know, somebody that that sort of does the, you know, the sex and drugs and rock and roll that that, you know, that that male rock artists uh, engage in. Uh, if, it, if you're a woman, then you get branded as a bad mother. Uh, and I think that women are all sort of, you know, even women in academia who are not doing the sex and drugs and rock and roll. I'm certainly not suggesting that. But I think, you know, always in the back of your mind is, you know, being a, being a good mother and then trying to balance it all. Yeah, I. Uh... I, I I also find it uh, interesting to think about 
ways, and this is a little, I'm sort of changing this, the subject here a little bit, but um, ways that we have all had to find to sort of empower ourselves uh, to make the decisions we've made, to continue going forward when we may not have a lot of support around us. And I'm not sure if you guys have things that you've specifically done or you think that have helped you to get to this point. I, I know for me that uh, I, you know, I talk about my, my running fairly often, but it's always been interesting to me that I find setting that time aside to do this kind of thing for myself and something that makes me feel so good and so empowered has been remarkably important to me. And just, uh, you know, so that's one way that, you know, I, I come back actually from a long run feeling quite different about myself. It, you're not, or not quite different, but, but stronger, more empowered, um, maybe the filter, if I was going to have a conversation immediately after I came back, the filter would be a little bit off. I, it's just, um, I, I don't know, I, I've just been mulling this over a, a little bit as I kind of think through what things have I set aside or, or have I made a priority in my life in addition to the work I do to try to enable me to do the work. And I don't know if you guys have similar things that have helped you or... I think running would probably kill me and would make me a very nasty and angry person. <laughs> I am not, I'm not athletic at all. Uh, you know, I find actually burying myself in the work. Uh, so, and, and pushing, uh, pushing everything else to the periphery. Um, you know, the work, I think for me, when I'm, when I'm in a project that I, when I'm embedded in a project that I find really, really interesting, um, that is its own reward to me. Uh, and everything, all the nattering and stuff that that happens, uh, you know, if you, you pushing that off to the periphery and just focusing on what's important, you know, um, I've always sort of thought that success is the best revenge. <laughs> that's a and, you know, and, and, you know, that's, that's kind of where I am at the moment. So no, I don't, I, I would say that the work is actually the work is actually the reward for me. Mm -hmm. I like biking early in the morning. <laughs> You but... guys are putting me to shame. <laughs> <laughs> now I feel completely <laughs> indolent. But I like completing a work, though. Yeah. Because you know how you know ideas came to your mind, and you have like ten different projects. I write books somewhere. I just compose somewhere. I compose electronic music and this and that. But they they're not all finished, you know. Right? Try to write book chapters. Do research. But when I finish them, okay, yes, finally I finished something because otherwise they just float around in my mind and I don't like that feeling. I had to, you know, finish this composition. I had to finish this instead of just, you know, do it. And yeah, that will be the mm -hmm. relief for me, I guess. No, I, com I completely get both what you guys are both saying about finishing the work and success being the best revenge. And yeah, no, I mean, I absolutely feel good about myself when I've piece of music is finished or a gig has gone well or an album has is, is come out. I just, I think maybe as a, a jazz player, the issues of improvising and the confidence, you know, and I'm thinking about this in terms of my students all the time, uh, the confidence issues loom large, being able to stand up, express yourself, especially if you're playing trombone or trumpet. And I'm also sort of trying to think of what kinds of things could be empowering for, you know, people who are having to make an in the moment young women who are having to make an in, in the moment statement or myself for that matter. And I guess I, I mentioned the running because I, I come back feeling, you know, I, the self doubt seems to be gone for, for a bit. And uh, otherwise I, I can find myself sometimes almost, you know, crippled when I'm composing, wondering if this it's good enough, which I don't, I mean, I'm sure some of my male colleagues and other fellow composers, you know, have self doubt as well. It's certainly not just a, a woman's problem, but, I uh, I do find that I've had to that, that the running and things like that have certainly helped make a difference in working with that. So that's the only reason I brought it up. You know, we have a question to discuss, uh, which I see in our chat about um, mentoring and educating and fostering, uh, you know, women and girls who are interested in the field. Um, and actually, uh, just just sort of piggybacking on what you just said, Ellen, I think sometimes it's helpful for for people. Uh, who are new to the field to recognize that self-doubt is not unique to them. Uh, and I have shared, uh, you know, my own self-doubt uh, with the occasional student uh, who, who I, you know, if I see someone who is sort of, you know, uh, totally paralyzed <laughs> by, by self-doubt, uh, sometimes it's helpful to say that this is not unique to you, that in fact, this is something that, that uh, 
you know that your that your 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 uh, professors and in particular your female professor, the person that you're talking to at the moment, uh, also experiences and sort of you know to to that that allows us to sort of talk about how we can get past it. Uh, and and that is one way that I reach out to particularly to female students who you know who 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 are you know who 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 feel that same kind of paralysis. Yeah, because when you're talking to them, you try to be like a, you know, a role model. So mm -hmm. you, we kind of try to be strong and just, you know, go get her, do this and do that. But inside is like, yeah, we're all like, how is it going to happen? Or yeah, it's sometimes I really find it helpful to to tell your very, very first mistake when you're in the field. It might be it's very technical detail so that they just don't, won't be afraid to ask questions. And I think it also helps uh, if they just create an event by themselves. Mm -hmm. It might be a concert, it might be just being on stage so that they can think, oh, I think I can do that. It's not a big deal to create this event. It's, it's not a big deal to finish a composition just within a week and then publish it online. Um, yeah. So, you know, sharing the spotlight and it, it's they also become a good role model for the other so that they can look up to and maybe relate to, you know, each other. I, th I think that's that's wonderful and, and yeah i've definitely shared moments of self-doubt with, with my students especially my female students or things that have not worked out quite as planned um i think in I, the idea of the fostering and mentoring i i had a neurothing experience just a couple weeks ago because i reached out we have a nice pool of seven young women who've been accepted to our jazz program for next year um which is i think the highest number ever just really wonderful uh, and I reached out to all of them and uh, just told them about some of the advocacy that I'm I'm doing uh, for for young women in jazz and just say that uh, you know if they came here we'll do girls nights out and we'll do you know we'll, we'll, we will stay hang together you know and that there's support and that there's some other young, wonderful young women in our program already actually quite a quite a few in comparison to other programs and just to, you know, feel free to reach out to me if they had any questions or here are some of the other female students in our program currently that, that they could email and get in touch with. And a couple of them wrote back and said they were, you know, they loved getting that email and that no other institution had done anything like that. And I just thought, that seems so odd to me. <laughs> you know, why wouldn't other places realize that a young woman coming into a jazz program would probably have questions and wondering what level of support there would be. But you know, good on us, but but still, I found that kind of shocking. When I arrived here uh, in two thousand five, I was one of two women. Uh, there was a third who was who was making her way to women's studies. So I was one of two uh, two full time women in the department. Uh, and we've since changed. Uh, we've expanded the, the number of women in the theory department. So, uh, and I, you know, I have to give credit to Patricia Hall when when she was hired as our department chair for being very very much on the ball uh, in, in that, uh, in, in addressing some of these inequities. Um, but uh, one thing that I found very helpful when I first came is that there was a, there was a group of women who would meet regularly, female faculty. You remember this, Ellen. Uh, that's something very ca casual. We did this for years. Uh, we would meet down at, downtown at a restaurant or we would meet at someone's home. We didn't even have to be talking about work, just, just to know that, uh, that that you were not alone. Uh, that was very important to me at a time when when I felt very isolated in a department that had very few women in it. Um, you know, the urgency to do this has has diminished with the you know with the hiring of more women into my department. But I actually really miss that. Uh, you know, uh, and and in my quest for tenure, uh, I was actually mentored through the advanced program. Uh, Abby Stewart was my was my mentor, and once again, sort of having a strong female voice for me uh, was a very important uh, piece in in my in my success in this place. Um, so. You know, so of course it's going to filter down to students if you can make that kind of thing happen for students as well. It makes all the difference. Yeah, even the, the small little virtual happy hours we had this summer where I miss those as well. You know, yes. we, we had, a you know, five or six of those, I think, and that was yeah. that was nice and we need to. But yeah, I agree. We need to get back to, to that when, when, you know, Zaina, you were officially invited, of course. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, seriously, it isn't about work. It's just about sort of hanging out and and just being in each other's space. That makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
Well, something that I've been doing in music theory, so we don't have, we have a very small minor, and of course we have a doctoral program. So we don't, we don't, um, we don't interact with students uh, in the same ways that you would, if, for example, in jazz or PAT. Um, but I've been very sort of mindful to, uh, in my teaching, to uh, to address some of the things that are of interest to me. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing mindful about it. I've been teaching a course on intersectionality in pop music for the last six years, I think, six, five or six summers for the um, master's a Muse Ed program. Uh, and what we do there is we talk about, you know, popular culture and, and its, repre its multiple representations of identity. Uh, uh, a very important and very interesting, I hope, but very certainly very important to music educators who are dealing with students uh, at very critical moments in their lives, uh, and those students being consumers of popular culture and finding ways that we can interrogate representation of you know, women, black women, uh, black men, uh, members of the LGBTQ community, um, you know, you name it, where are, where are people with, with, uh, with disabilities and, and how are they being represented in popular culture? Uh, so we, we tackle, you know, aging, there's my favorite topic right there, but we do talk about ageism uh, and its intersection with sexism uh, in popular culture. Uh, and you know I, that that to me is probably one of my most uh, significant and important contributions to the school uh, because we actually it gives us a moment to talk about you know how we look out at the world and what we see reflected back at us uh, for good or for bad and sort of interrogating those uh, those identities as they're represented in popular culture. Um, I've actually uh, mounted that course twice now for music students as well. So I always find those dialogues very, very interesting. And they're not exclusively about the gender, but gender is a big piece of those dialogues. That's, that's wonderful. And, and I, I do think that's something that maybe as, a, um, as women faculty members, if we do have a chance to get together and, and mm -hmm. chat in the fall, that's something we can think about is, is, are there other courses like that, that we, and again, not just dealing with gender, but all kinds of accessibility issues and diversity of in all its shapes and forms. Um, so that might be an exciting thing to think about. Even if we only created one new course, uh, that would be that would be terrific. Well, um, there was the question about the pandemic. And oh yeah, how, yeah. How I don't know how you guys feel. I, I would say that actually a lot of my women colleagues or women professional, you know, composers and artists are actually uh, flourishing. I mean, obviously we're missing playing live, but I've seen so many of my friends on Facebook and all kinds of you know social media doing these amazing projects during the pandemic, remote recording, uh, com composing, whatever. So I would say that I don't feel that we've been significantly affected necessarily you know because of our gender during the pandemic i'm not sure what you guys feel well i guess I, the only thing i would say is that i'm glad i don't have children that are being homeschooled oh, um, yeah. and so if i was a if i was a mother i would i would feel that i was being disproportionately affected mm -hmm. um so this is when i really think about motherhood uh and and its and its impact on uh, its impact on people in the field, and in particular, you know, people people who are people who have children are likely going to be people who are at the earlier stages of their career. Not always, uh, but you know, people who are who are building tenure cases and yet trying to sort of juggle that, uh, and and or else building cases to 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 um, to get to that full professor where we are so underrepresented. Uh, and sort of juggling all of those demands uh, and also and also homeschooling. So I have, you know, I don't have children, but on either side of me uh, where I live, uh, there are there are parents with children who are, you know, they're bored and they they hate Zoom and, you know, all of this. And and I think they're pulling their hair out. And I can't imagine being a professor with all of that as well. So no, I personally have not felt uh, felt that it's affected me. I, I'm I've actually kind of enjoyed um, the time you know the, the time that I would spend sort of going going driving back and forth to school or you know driving to meetings or you know that is time that I've actually uh, taken to to do some work uh, and and focus on my own work. But you know I have the luxury of being able to focus, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, on student sites, if I had to compare from my in-person teachings, I believe students started to share their struggles more often, mm -hmm. especially through through office hours. So mm -hmm. at some point, I feel like 
like a therapist almost <laughs> not I, I i'm trying to teach but i they you know all of a sudden they started to feel like they feel trapped they feel very sad and they don't know what to do they don't have any power because of the all the hard work they have to finish and then i thought maybe i can just call up compare them and collaborate you know create some kind of assignment so that they can collaborate but it never works so it didn't work out but yeah i thought if they share you know their struggles but previously when office hours they basically came to the office hour and we talk about their problems but right now they actually talk about their psychological problems or struggles in general yeah i found that to be the case as, as well to, trying to i've been doing a lot of in-person teaching i've been lucky to well i've been lucky to stay healthy um and i've been lucky that our students have been so responsible and and really you know, not bringing the virus into, into our classes. Mm -hmm. um, but I have definitely uh, been having a lot of private conversations with the students who are, you know, who are struggling during this time. But I'm so glad you, you brought up the, the old issue of, of motherhood, Karen, with, with this, um, you know, in terms of being productive. I have to say, too, I cannot imagine uh, how people are, are doing it mm -hmm. um, right now, how mothers are balancing children at home and trying to get work work of their own done so uh, I know. there's only so much zoom you can take you know i can yeah. take my own zoom but i can't imagine take you know having to having to contend with the zoom of someone else that's you know that's having a meltdown in the corner because they can't figure out a grade two math problem or whatever i just can't imagine it no i, I i'm exhausted just with you know <laughs> what's going on when teaching and trying to get work done exactly. I, I mean if it's you know wow if i had children at home i'd I, <laughs> Don't know what I would do. So my hat is off to everyone who is raising children in this environment right now. So yeah, I'm with you on that. Well, this has been a great chat. Boy, I've missed seeing you guys in 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 the uh, in the flesh. It'll be nice. <laughs> it'll be nice when we can actually get together. Can't can't wait. And Zena, it's been so nice to meet you and get yeah, to know you nice. a little bit. And uh, I yeah, I can't believe this is the first time we're meeting, but we'll have oh, to yeah. try that. <laughs> <laughs> very soon and, and oh, thank you so much. We'll start, start getting together again as soon as possible yes well women's women's date night again as soon as we can as soon as we're all vaccinated it'll be it'll be oh, something yeah. to look forward to yes, Absolutely. well i share this has been great and uh i look forward to, to doing it again very soon yeah.